You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Why Oak, formed in Baltimore, Maryland in 2006 by Jen Wozner and Andy Stack. The two of them had played music together when they were teenagers, before starting Why Oak as a recording project. They self-released their debut album, If Children, in 2007, prior to signing with Merge Records. Their second album, The Knot, was released in 2009, followed by the My Neighbor, My Creator EP in 2010. Their third album, Civilian, was released in 2011. In this episode, for the 10th anniversary, Jen Wozner and Andy Stack look back on how Civilian came together. This is The Making of Civilian. Hi, my name is Jen Wozner, and I play in the band Y Oak, and I'm here to talk about the 10th anniversary of the Y Oak record, Civilian. You know, it's interesting to think back on that record with the perspective that I now have, because, you know, it's impossible to separate my experience, or for so long it has been impossible to separate my experience of that record and of the music from the time of my life. It was a really difficult really painful, really dark time for me. I was just running around in circles, working constantly, exhausting myself, and putting myself under an immense amount of of pressure. And in some ways, kind of getting the validation that I thought that I had wanted from outside, from external sources, through you know the record being so well received and things going so well from a career standpoint, but I was miserable. And it's scary, I think, when you get the thing that you want and you're still miserable. My name is Andy Stack, and I'm a member of Y Oak, and I'm here to talk about the record Civilian. When I think back to that period, I think we were really smashing everything together with touring and recording and writing. And we were, I guess we were in our early 20s, and Civilian was our third record. So we had done two records and an EP, and I think right around like the EP like 2010, we started to get really like more substantial support tour opportunities. And at that age, I think it was both, you know, our own internal idea and also what people were telling us, like we were like, we need to take every single opportunity that comes to us. And so we were taking all these tours that would be like, here's a support tour for like three weeks and it butts right up to another support tour. And we would just be like, away a lot and then somewhere in the middle of that we you know were working on these songs for a civilian and finding some time to rehearse we were rehearsing them like in the attic of my house mostly and you know as I remember it we kind of snuck into the studio in between tours and then we were kind of like back out and we wanted to just get the recording in wherever we could it's kind of hard to remember um, because so much of my life was kind of, it's kind of a weird blur. I mean, I can remember I was living in Baltimore with my friends, Jason and Katie, in this sort of attic room in a stone house in a neighborhood called Stone Hill. And, you know, we'd come back from a tour. I was experiencing that sort of 
post tour classic post tour depression malaise lack of structure and i remember spending a lot of time in that room writing you know i think the experience of writing has always been positive for me and i i i don't think that the the actual writing of the songs was in any way stressful or unpleasant because like the writing process is my favorite part of the process and that's the part where i find the most like catharsis and feel most connected to what i'm doing it's everything that happens after that that i think is where the struggle starts to begin i feel like at every point in my life when i was like 18 or when i was like 20 or 25 or 30 at that point i was always like cool now i'm an adult and i have my shit together like now i'm like a fully realized adult and which is of course like a ludicrous concept and like we were still you know children ostensibly at that point and we were on our third record so i think i don't know about you jen but for me i think there was a little bit of a feeling like oh like we're like now seasoned veterans or something like that and we know how to make a record we know how to do it you know the proper way of course that's ridiculous I mean, one thing I will say, though, is that it wasn't really until we started playing more shows and touring more regularly that we zeroed in on the configuration that became our, you know, the first iteration of our live set, which was, you know, Andy playing drums and key bass, and I played guitar and sang. And at that point, we had been performing in that configuration for long enough that we sort of understood its advantages and understood its limitations and understood the roles that we played within it. One thing that I will say is that Civilian as a record was sort of like, I think the first record we made where we had that experience under our belt of actually performing as a live band and understood the palette that we had available to us sonically. And I still think of it as kind of like the pinnacle of what we were capable of with that setup and with those arrangements within that configuration. However, because, you know, we're artists and we have artist brains that want to grow and change and evolve and expand, you know, when you feel as though you've reached the pinnacle of what you can do with a certain palette or framework of a thing, you know, it's hard to feel like you want to go back and mine the same area all over again. So it kind of presented us with a challenge as well. Civilian was the first time that we had a, um, you know, quote unquote producer who was helping with, with the mix. And I think we had definitely some trepidation about like giving up control. I think there's been some element of that at various points on all the records we've made where we, we want to just like grasp the thing close and tight until, you know, probably in some cases we like suck all the life out of it. And so it was a it was a valuable kind of education to give up control. And when we were mixing the record, we would go, we were we mixed it with John Congleton, who now lives in LA, but at the time he was in Dallas. And he would like, you know, work on a song for a few hours and then we'd come back and, and then work collaboratively on finalizing mixes. And so he would like sort of banish us from his studio for several hours. I'm so happy that you brought up Dallas because it it really just triggered all these memories of like ominousness. Like I feel like there was real this real like sense of ominous energy around even just like the the mixing of that record and finishing that record. There was just this like really weird heavy energy to it. Congleton tended to sort of want to have like his his privacy when he was working on his like first pass of a mix and so one of those times we went at the time it was my first visit to you know the grassy knoll the like site of uh, the jfk assassination in dallas downtown and the sky was really strange and green and yellow and there was there was this weird stillness in the air and no one was around and it just like felt very spooky but we you know didn't really know we weren't really paying too close attention we're just kind of like looking around being like, oh, this is, look at this. There's that building. There's this, you know, like just kind of doing the touristy thing. At one point, I remember looking up at the horizon and just seeing a huge tornado touchdown, not that far away. And it kind of all clicked at that moment. And it was just like, oh, the reason why the sky is this weird, you know, ominous color and no one's out on the street and everything feels kind of heavy is because there's a 
fucking tornado warning and we're supposed to be inside or like probably in a basement. You know, later on, uh, we came to find out that that tornado had touched down like very, very close to the hotel that we were staying in. And so it was just this real spooky kind of missed connection sort of, I don't know, it was just a very, I remember there being a lot of strange energy flying around during that, that last visit, that mix, that mixing visit. Yeah, his studio at the time in Dallas was was uh, an ex-funeral home, and he's a he's a macabre motherfucker. So he's a he's a pretty morbid dude, and I think he loved that about it. But yeah, there was just like a real strange, spooky, kind of heavy energy to that time, if I can remember correctly. Congleton really has this ethos of first thought, best thought of like going with your intuition when you're working on, on a mix or working on producing a record. But that was, that was like jarring for us. And it felt, you know, he is not about polishing the thing to perfection. He, he likes to keep the raw mistake elements in there if they help to make the thing feel more alive and more human. And so we had a fair amount of conversations with him in the process of mixing the record where we felt like, oh, this, you know, drum hit is a little off or this guitar part like sticks out a little too much. And, you know, he'd be like, oh, that's the good stuff. I mean, I feel like you're being very diplomatic and everything you're saying is true, but there's also this side to it where like we had come in, you know, we're a couple of Pro Tools babies and we like, that's the way we make records and we've always made records and kind of continue to because we're only two people, you know, we're not a band full of musicians in a room capturing what's happening in real time. We're a couple of, you know, producer weirdos who like to hole up on our little DAWs and like move things around and like create these spaces, which is, you know, sort of like a new, a relatively new way of like creating music. That's more and more common, obviously. But Congleton, was very much uh, anti recall. You know, he didn't he didn't want to work in the box. He wanted to uh, mix to the board. And so basically, what that meant for us, we didn't know this going into it, but that what that meant for us was that we would have to basically commit to a mix, like you know, on site essentially. And then if there was something about it that we didn't like the next day, like for example, you you know, you, you commit to a mix and then you listen back and you're like, oh, this is perfect, except, you know, the tambourine's like maybe two or three dBs too loud. Tough shit, that's a full remix from scratch because there's no recall. <laughs> and that was a really tough thing for the two of us to um, wrap our heads around because A, we didn't expect it. And B, it's just so, it was so antithetical to the way we were accustomed to making music and just sort of like agonizing over things. I do think I understand in many ways um, the philosophy behind it. However, I'm pretty sure he does recall now and I'll leave it at that. (laughs) With that said, he does great work and he's a brilliant, brilliant producer and mixer. and And he works faster than I think anybody I've ever seen yeah before. yeah he's so fast he trusts his intuition he's got great intuition and a huge part of the way that record sounds is owed to him and i'm really happy with the way it sounds I don't know what any of these songs are about anymore.
<laughs> That's going to be a great podcast. Um, <laughs> I do remember, um, if not the first time, one of the first times we played South by Southwest was the year Alex Chilton died. And I believe that Big Star was set to play that year at South by, and I was really excited about it as a, a huge long time big star fan and and yeah i don't know i think uh sometimes there are these little moments in your life that you're basically like not connected to in any sort of real or tangible sense but it just sort of reminds you of your mortality and the, the very finite nature of existence but at the same time you don't necessarily feel that you deserve to be affected by the death of a person who you know, in, in truth, like you only think, you know, but you don't actually know. And so, and that's something that I still feel like a lot of people are dealing with is in regards to like feeling connected to, and really feeling like, uh, they know people whose art and work that they appreciate, but in reality, you know, their humanity is so much greater and so much more multidimensional. And so I think that that was probably something that was on my mind at the time. If I had to guess, if I had to if I had to drop myself back into the brain of 25 year old was, you know how trauma works where like every, you don't remember things. I have that. Yeah. The, the trauma of having to be at South by Southwest. Yes, precisely. <laughs> oh, This song, The Altar, now, I don't actually have much memory of the way this song came to be, but I do know that I think a lot of people make the mistake that it is altar with an A, like a like an altar in a church. But in reality, it's altar with an E, like an alternate. You know, I've done a lot of thinking, and I still, I think a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the writing that I do has to do with sort of exploring the multitude of selves that comprise our one capital S self that we kind of like lead with and think of, you know, as being our, our core identity or our essence, but that like all of these multitudes, these parts that comprise our being. I think that this song was maybe one of the first times I can remember digging into that concept and trying, I guess, to make peace with the fact that I wasn't ever going to be one dimensional and that in a lot of ways, the choices that I was making in my life were such that as time continued to pass, I would inevitably become further and further removed from the lives of the majority of people that I knew and cared about. And that continues to be true. I think civilian, it's funny that I was having these thoughts when I was a 25 year old, because having these thoughts as a 35 year old is fewer and fewer of my friends you know, I mean, I'm a single person with no children living alone. And I like that. I'm, I'm very pleased with my life as it stands. But there are certainly moments, you know, like, for example, during the global pandemic, um, <laughs> where it feels a little bit strange and odd, and sad and lonely to not have that sort of domestic sense of home and family that a lot of people my age, at this point, the majority of people my age, have. And so I think that that was, it's interesting to sort of like think about the fact that I was beginning to contend with that reality when I was 25 and I'm still contending with it now.
there's a line in it specifically about that. I can't quite remember what it is off the top of my head, but I know panic is mentioned. And yes, um, this was the time in my life where I was most consumed with anxiety <laughs> because I was at my most unhealthy and I was at my most overworked. And God, when I think back on how terribly unkind to myself I was, it makes me so sad. It's taken me, it's a journey, you know, it's, it's something of an unfolding path that I think I'll always be hopefully growing and learning a little bit more about how to exist in the body that I have and how to make peace with myself and my brain and, and to like make the choices that put me in, that give me the best chance to not be a miserable wreck. Um, but at the time I just had no skills. I didn't have any tools in my toolkit. That's sort of like our dub song, you know, and there's there's a lot of like studio dubbing of tracks and vocal to sort of create that kind of washy atmosphere that you hear. So yeah, I think that that like those effects had a, a lot to do and also kind of went above and beyond the typical role of a of a mix engineer. And I think that was another thing we were learning too. I mean, I think if I going back to that time of my life, I think I still had a lot to learn about like what stage of the process a record needs to be at to be ready to be mixed. I think a lot of mixers probably would have been like, this is something that you should have done before. Like, I'm just here to mix. I'm just here to like even all the levels out. And fortunately, that's not really the way John works either. You know, he he likes to have a creative hand in things. And so, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff like that unfolding. Yeah, I mean, he's really got a, an ability to sort of like, saturate a sound to the point of like beautiful ugliness it's sort of a signature of his that i really admire and um it sounds you know his mixes sound like him which i think is like a really cool quality when someone has like a a real stamp and a style and a voice in something like that <laughs> I'm definitely a person who like believes in the power and magic of the universe. And I respect all sorts of religious traditions as, you know, as a framework for people to sort of explore their own spirituality. But I think the more poisonous aspects of religion, of organized religion, are sort of the cause of much of human suffering and pain and violence and not even if you want to, you know, just talk about it on a personal scale rather than like a global scale. Um, shame, shame. It's just a source of so much shame and that feeling of I am bad, I am wrong. And a lot of what I'm talking about, what I'm exploring in those songs on this record have to do with deconstructing my own relationship to shame and where it came from. And, you know, there was definitely some religion in my upbringing. I wasn't in the most strictly religious family but it was there i and also it's just sort of it's ambient it's in the air like we pick it up you know it's around so i think that there's a lot of uh like in a song like holy holy or in this record and in a lot of my songs that's sort of like exploring where that shame came from and how it operates unconsciously to rule my life in ways that i sometimes don't even realize and can't control Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like that the inspiration for this song was actually Cold-Blooded Old Times, the smog song. <laughs> 
Do you, does that ring a bell or am I just making that up? I mean, when I hear our demo of it, that's like immediately what I think um, that we're just like copying Bill Callahan, which is not, uh, if we were getting into pop music at this time, then uh, that was clearly not one of the pop influences. I don't know if the, you know, the demo of that song, I don't know if we were specifically like, this is the thing, or if it was just like, we're in like an attic and we have like a limited palette. I, you know, when I hear demos from that era, it doesn't feel to me like we were consciously trying to make it sound like a thing. It was more meant to be like a, a document for posterity so that we could like work through song forms and figure out what we're doing. And in the process of that, because we were in this like very cramped little attic room with a dinky little practice amp and a dinky little uh, drum set, everything sounds like smaller and more like bedroomy as a result, which actually is very charming to me <laughs> when I go back and listen to it now. It feels like it just feels like a totally different way of experiencing those songs. Yeah, I mean, I like those weird little demos. I mean, they're sloppy as hell. I never would have imagined in a million years that I would have ever let anyone hear them. But they have a certain, they have a certain energy to them that's sweet, that I like. I mean, it's funny because I'm still writing songs about surrender and control. Like the most recent song that we just released called It's Way With Me that came out just a couple weeks ago is all about surrendering to the forces of the universe and making peace with the fact that like control is an illusion. And that line from Holy Holy, you know, it is madness seeking mastery is basically the same concept. It's like there are forces in life that are bigger than us. And to think that we can somehow avoid being controlled by them, these very like real and human uh, parts of like the experience of being alive is, is foolish, you know, to say that, you know, I mean, that's partially why I think I struggle so much with the idea of marriage for one example is like, I just don't believe that human beings are capable of making that kind of promise <laughs> and in, in genuineness, not to say that I like, I look down on people who make that choice, or I think, you know, I don't think it's very beautiful and brave to know that and make that choice anyway, because I do. It's a wonderful act of like bravery in the face of uncertainty and lack of control. However, you know, I think that, you know, what is the saying? The fool is the one who says he knows and the, the wise person is the person who says he doesn't know, something like that. It's like, it's out of our fucking hands. And, and to pretend otherwise is, is just a bit silly. Can see yourself in evolution. This was sort of one of my like angrier songs that had to do with um, people growing to attach to stories and guiding their lives by stories rather than letting their hearts and their intuition, their empathy and their care for real people in real time dictate their choices. You know, I think that there is also that whatever that impulse is that I think some people have a really hard time being like, I'm not an animal. You know, I'm something else. We're, we're, we're not monkeys. <laughs> you know, that thing of just like, oh, you're just afraid. You're just afraid to die. Like you're afraid that you will, you will waste away into eternity. I eternity. <laughs> uh, I like that though. Um, you will waste away into eternity like every other living creature on this planet. I think now I have more compassion for it. I think at the time I was angrier. I was just an angrier person in general. I think now it's just like easy for me to be like, yeah, of course people need religion. They're scared shitless and life is terrifying. It's just a series of losses, one after another, after another. So like if that helps make you feel better, 
I love that for you. But yeah, I mean, I think that there's also some frustration and some anger. I can't take a superstition. Jesus, give me your permission. With Dog's Eyes, with the coda, I guess you would call it on Dog's Eyes, we definitely wanted it to sound, probably more than any other moment of the record, we wanted it to sound like really fucked up and busted. And we made a lot of choices in the mixing with John Congleton to try to push it in that direction, to make it feel like whatever, like the song was just breaking apart. And I remember, <laughs> I remember us like, in that pause between the the second verse and the, uh, the the last chorus, we just didn't quite have it yet, and we were like, I don't know, John. Like, we need some kind of. Uh, it needs to feel like very menacing, like this this like storm cloud is coming in, and we just like we were kind of at a loss with it. And then he, a total John Congleton thing. He was like bleep bloop bleep bloop like five seconds, and then there was this like. I don't even know what he did. Some kind of like bit crushed reverse bass part where it's like this, this um, like ramping up doom scape thing that happens in that break, like a, and it just like appeared out of nowhere. And we had no idea. Like we were literally right there in the space with him. We had no idea what he had just done. And it was like this revelation, like, okay, cool. We're like, we're dealing with a, a real, um, monster here so he did that but yeah we we wanted it to sound really fucked up With this record and with this, you know, with the song "Civilian," it was about contending with not living the life of this, you know, so-called like good woman, or like not relating to these normative ideas of what relationships should look like or what a life should look like. I think now I'm celebrating that. I think at the time it felt very dark and it felt very confusing and it felt like there weren't any, like my path was very murky and dark and that I didn't really understand or have any idea of like what it held because of that. It was this concept for me of like trying to perform goodness, whatever that I had internalized that meaning, and then also just not being able to pull it off entirely because it wasn't authentic for me. And I think at the time I had internalized the idea of goodness as staying in one relationship until you die. <laughs> and. That's just not something I have been able to do in my life. And only now, at 35, am I starting to begin to unpack the layers and layers of shame that I've internalized from that reality for me, um, that that was never going to be the thing. I mean, I don't necessarily feel like I, I understand all of the reasons why that is, but it's part of who I am. You know, I think I sort of am, in many ways, fundamentally alone. I, I think my autonomy is really important to me. And then I think like I also value and treasure intimacy 
but it's like you come meet me where I am for as long as the connection exists. And then if it doesn't exist then I move forward and we, we separate. And so that's sort of the way that I've lived my life. But I think that there was so much shame for me around that being making me bad. Like I, I'm a bad person for like not being able to like stick it out and make it work like all my forebears did. And they were so happy. God, they were so happy, weren't they? They loved every minute of it. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that that was a lot of what was beginning to become clear to me. And it was just the tip of the iceberg as I later found out in the resulting decade of my life. When you make a choice about how to live your life, inevitably there are possibilities that you leave behind. And I think I made the right choice for the person that I am. And also I honor the fact that I, as a woman who you know, was born in a time in history where I actually was able to make that choice. You know, I think my, my mother's generation and certainly my grandparents' generation and beyond, like you know, the, the option of doing what I'm doing with my life now and like not having a family and not having to sort of like run a household and be essentially an unpaid domestic servant was not an option for them. And it is an option for me. And that doesn't mean that there are times in my life where I'm like, wow, I really feel my, I feel my otherness or like I feel alienated or I feel scared of being alone or what have you, but the choice was there to make. And so it's sort of like, and I knew, I think I always knew intuitively that it was the choice that I needed to make for me. And that like the path for me was sort of like an artist's path. And, and like that was what was, was going to make me actually feel like happy and fulfilled. Definitely seems like there was a particular relationship that was maybe ending or had ended when you were writing for this, but it sounds like a pretty heavy relationship. Maybe kind of yeah, unhealthy. Yeah, it I don't was. Know if you want to talk about that? It wasn't unhealthy. It was our relationship. It was mine and Andy's relationship, um, which I think is maybe not something we've ever really talked about. Nor do I really feel like particularly thrilled to talk about <laughs> it now, but it's the truth. You know, it's like. I'm really, it was really heavy. I mean, we were in the van together. We were in a relationship and it was ending and we didn't want to lose everything at the same time. And so we chose to do the hard thing, which was let the relationship evolve into something else while trying to maintain our connection as friends and people who care about each other very deeply and people who want to make music together. So that was what we were going through. And we really never stopped. We never stopped being in a band. We never stopped touring, you know. Yeah, we 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 went out on on a tour like six weeks after we broke off our romantic relationship, and we yeah we never really we never really took a break from the the collaborative relationship. But I think we, something that we felt was that we were processing a lot of the end of that at the time, uh, you know, prior to even splitting up. So by the time we ended up ending our relationship, we, we had already, you know, made peace with ourselves. And then it was just making peace with the rest of the world and making everyone else understand that we were okay and that we were going to continue to be, be a band. And also be like in each other's lives. You know, Andy is like, it's funny. Cause I say this, I know you won't be offended by this. Um, but like thinking about dating you is thinking about 
it feels like thinking about dating my brother. Like, because like you are, I've known you since I was 15 years old, you know, you're like family to me. And I think that in many ways, like the time that we were together romantically was like much less than the time that we have been like dear close friends and collaborators. And so it's just one of those funny things where like it very much happened, but it's also like, it's just, and now it's sort of just like, yeah, but yeah, he's, he's, he's like my brother. He's like, you know, he's like my oldest friend. Um, and I'm proud of that. Like, I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to navigate. And like, it, in many ways, I think it's easier to just sort of like put your hands up and be like, nope, like can't, it's too weird, it's too much, you know, but I'm really proud that we were able to sort of like navigate that transition, I think as gracefully as we did. It wasn't always easy, but like, we're still here, you know, we're still in some ways, although the the, the collaboration has evolved, the relationship has evolved, but like we're still do, in doing this in some form, in some capacity, which is something that is a point of pride. Yeah, yeah, I gotta take a second to just uh, change my like concept of the album, I guess, <laughs> that it was the two of you. That's really, really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes forget, I'm like, I feel like everybody knows that, but I guess that's not really something we really ever talked about, was it? No, we were very, we very consciously omitted that information at the time because it felt it felt too fresh and too personal. So we we definitely kept that out of it, and it, and that was also, you know, aside from being that a lot of the record was about our relationship. I think it was also at a time, Jen, where you were really opposed to having your words printed or analyzed really directly. And you, you wanted the, you wanted the song to be the song and not to be written words, not to be a poem, not to be a conversation about it necessarily, but let it just, stand for what it is and so there was a little bit of like cloaked meaning that i think you especially like were very intentional about when we were rolling out the record well and i still feel that way to a large degree philosophically speaking that's absolutely how i feel about songs and songwriting where like i don't believe that they are necessarily meant to have the words and the music be separate from one another because it's not about yeah it's not about reading words and determining a literal meaning it's about like creating a sonic and emotional landscape and having an experience and the ambiguity that results in not really understanding exactly what i'm saying at every given moment is the very the very thing that allows the listener to develop a relationship with the song and, and insert themselves into it and hear what they think they hear and make what meaning that they need to make out of it. I feel like I've always gone out of my way to leave that space in the songs that I, that I write because I, I believe that that is sort of part of what makes songs universal and what makes them for others and not just specifically a document of like my experience which is why i sometimes forget the origin because it's really not it's really about like creating the space for others to for, sort of like experience their own selves and their own thoughts and their own minds and, and their and feel their feelings and and yeah so i think that that was something that i really was a stickler about like not printing my lyrics not having them printed anywhere and leaving that sense of ambiguity I've kind of loosened up about it because I've loosened up about a lot of things because I'm older now and I just don't really give a shit. Um, <laughs> but, um, and also because people want to know and I'd rather them know what the real thing is than to sort of like, I don't know. It's fine. If people want to know, they should know. I don't need to be a pretentious dweeb about it. But that is, that is true. That is how I feel. I want to love you like my mother.
that's just Andy playing. I don't think I play the guitar solo on that record at all. I mean, I certainly played a shit ton of guitar solos after the fact for years and years and years until I never wanted to hear the words guitar solo ever again. Uh, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, that's you, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think that that guitar solo is me on Civilian, but I think that in the studio there was some back and forth of like trying to figure out what the energy of the thing should be. And it started out with, you know, Jen playing some stuff and then I took the guitar and then it went back to her. And then, but, you know, as we sort of pared it down, as, as often happens in the studio, you know, it, it ended up being like that, that, that was all me, but that happens pretty often in, you know, not just on that record, but like whenever we're recording where it's like one of us has an idea and the other one is micromanaging the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And has whatever, you know, whatever kind of skill set, whether it's on, you know, keys or on drums or whatever to, to execute what the other person is hearing, uh, just like a little more cleanly or with a little more of whatever we're looking for. The song Fish is about, it's about grieving for my family, which, you know, I've always said that that's not really my story to tell, but there's a, a certain amount of trauma in my upbringing involving um, addiction and mental illness. And um, I love my family very dearly. And fortunately, the parties in question are all still with us at this moment, at least. But it's been, to say the least, a bumpy ride. There are many, many songs in my catalog that deal with processing the grief that comes from watching the people that I love the most in the world suffer greatly and not be able to do anything about it at all. And that's one of them. When you tour in America, which we were just starting to do more and more at that time in our lives, we spend a lot of time driving through the American Southwest. And, you know, we're both from the East Coast, a place with hills and mountains and trees. And at that point in my life, I hadn't spent too much time in these absolutely vast, wide open desert spaces where you can really just truly see the world play out in front of you for miles and miles. And in many cases, one of the most interesting things that happen in those landscapes is being able to see these weather patterns moving in like long before they reach you. So you can kind of like catch these clouds and these storm patterns at you know in tremendous distances. I, one of the reasons why I love to drive so much, um, fortunately for me, <laughs> is you know you really sort of get to immerse yourself in the landscape and reflect on it and sort of be in motion, but also be still. Uh, which is such a specific feeling. And so the song Plains is really about using that phenomena of being able to observe this weather pattern imminently before it reaches you is a sort of a metaphor for that sense of foreboding and dread that I think a lot of this record is permeated with, of this feeling of there being something wrong or something bad that's going to happen or some sort of tragedy or catastrophe that is afoot and you can sort of sense it before you can see it. And so that is the sort of the central metaphor, that desert landscape and the approaching storm.
Well, you know, so like the metaphor being that like there's a sense of foreboding dread and then there's like the thing that happens. And so those big bursts, those big like unexpected moments, like those those big hits that happen in the song were sort of meant to feel abrupt and unexpected and, and like because they don't necessarily happen when you're thinking that they will. And that, you know, it's like a sonic representation of, of the metaphor of like, you can sense that something's coming, but you don't know exactly when it's going to come. The, the like groove sort of lulls you into this sense of unsettled, but like patterned security. And then there's like a moment where like a bang that kind of shakes you out of it. And so that's sort of what the song was kind of built to represent. The drums on planes, I think was maybe one of the first times we ever messed around with like, some more deliberate processing, like delay processing on drums. I think the drums and the bass both have these like kind of dubby delays that come in in between the verses when there, there's like a, um, a sound of like crickets or reeds or something, some kind of field recording that I made that, that like sweeps up in, in the middle of those moments and, and really kind of puts you in the space. It's like you're sort of being like projected into the desert in in those breaks and there's also the the bass and the drums both have these like dub delay swells that build up yes yeah, sim- i guess that's like a, a smaller version of the really extreme hits that we're talking about at the ends of the verses it's like i know that we we wanted that song planes to feel really expansive and wide open because of the you know the lyrical content I love the song Hottest Day. I, I think maybe lyrically, it's one of my strongest. I remember very specifically being in this very hot attic bedroom that I was of the house that I was living in in Baltimore in the summer. <clears throat> you know, I had this like shitty little window unit that barely cooled the space. And the song was about absence. The song was about longing and missing someone. Just because they're they're not present doesn't mean that the longing disappears. And you know, obviously, the central metaphor there being like you're in this space and it's sweltering and it's hot, but like the sun goes down and there's just no relief. Even in those like muggy Baltimore summer nights, where you just can't escape the oppressive heat and humidity, and you're dying for a break from it, but it's just it's just hanging in the air all the time, and. Um, I remember very specifically being in in that space Um, and then using that as sort of a metaphor of like, you know, when someone isn't present in your life, but they take up so much space in your brain and just because you can't see them doesn't mean that their, their presence isn't felt and about sort of longing and missing in that way. I have a lot of songs in non-standard time signatures, but I think this might be one of my only songs in the verses are in five and then the coda is in six, which means nothing to anyone really, but me, I, I don't know why I care, but it feels nice to be able to make something that's catchy and askew. And I'm pleased with myself when I managed to do it. <laughs>
we were wealth in my mind is is sort of about self control. It's about learning what it means to grow up and. Uh, you know, that, that buying like I'm living like a child. Oh, I'm grown. I'm living like a child. And, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of shame in that too. It's just sort of like when my life doesn't look a particular way, I assume that that like means that I am somehow like I lack emotional development or I'm like living on borrowed time in this weird way. And I think there's also some references to like dealing with not being born into like generational wealth essentially and sort of having to like care for myself and make my own way in the world um, from a pretty young age to have to support myself and learn how and also to have to do that in a field where it's sort of notoriously difficult to succeed uh, and even if you do succeed doesn't necessarily mean that you make money and so the fear of just sort of like being like, oh, I'm walking this weird tightrope. This is my calling and I'm going to pursue it. But like, I don't know how I'm going to like pull this off. And then that's sort of where the title comes from. It's like, we were wealth. It's sort of like, what is, what do you truly value? Like, what are you fixing as a priority in your life? And why are you making the choices that you're making? And if you're prioritizing the acquisition of capital, you know, like literal wealth, then you're probably not in the right line of work. <laughs> and if you're prioritizing a depth of experience and connection to other human beings and connection to your creative practice and a sense of like satisfaction in the universe, then your wealth is the wealth of, of experience, of feeling, of love, of connection. It's sort of about like making peace with the fact that those things that I would prioritize in my life not necessarily just the acquisition of material gains. You know, playing as a duo in that setup, we could put a lot of volume out, but we can only go so far in terms of like density. And We Were Wealth is all about this sort of like Phil Spector style density at the end, like wanting to just have like all of the things chugging all at once. Until last year when we played as a five piece uh, for some touring right before, you know, the pandemic. We uh, had never really played that song in a live setting. I think we knew at that point that the song Doubt would be the actual final track. And so, but that song is so minimal that it, it's sort of like, I think of that as sort of like this light, this sort of conclusion, like a concluding statement. And it's sort of just this gentle, like hand on your back. And it's, but like We Were Wealth is the final full band moment. It's the exit of that, that sort of like full palette and then sort of doubt is kind of just like this gentle afterthought. If you should doubt my heart Remember this That I would lie to you If I I'm still really proud of that song. 
I do remember writing it and I remember finishing it and I remember knowing. I tend to have these experiences with writing where I know like, oh, this is an opener or oh, this is a closer. Like it's when you think about records as a whole, you know, needing introductory statements and concluding statements. There's just a sense that you get like that's the one. And um, I still really feel connected to that song, which I can't, certainly can't say for all the songs I wrote, you know, 12 years ago. That song popped into my head. This is going to sound so fucking narcissistic. (laughs) Um, But you know what? I was going through this breakup this year. It was a really hard year. You know, I made a whole record about it. It was like a thing. Um, And, but I remember when I I was in this sort of in the thick of that and I was doing a lot of journaling and sort of just like processing. And I had this moment of being like thinking of the line, what I have learned of you does not assure you bow before my will. And being like, that's cool. What is that? And then being like, (laughs) oh, it's myself. (laughs) Oh, so embarrassing. Um, But, you know, I, I, it's, I think it's really a point of pride that like that song, the fact that it still resonates with me now and it's something that I would write today makes me feel as though it must have tapped into some kind of truth which is kind of the whole point. And so it's nice to have that validated from a decade into the future and as a completely different version of myself to be like, oh, I still connect with that. That's, I know what that means. It still resonates with me. We can connect, we can meet each other in these shared spaces, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, we are two autonomous beings with worlds and lives of our own, you know, and like all the love in the world and all the knowledge in the world does not ensure that you have this control over how the situation plays out, that you can control how your feelings change or how people's lives and needs change. You know, it's like, it serves a purpose. It has a meaning but that doesn't mean that you get to force it into, to unfold in the way that you would have hoped it would. Again, it's like surrender. It's surrender and the fact that control is an illusion, but like making peace with that in a way of allowing yourself to be free and allowing the other person to be free, to be who they are. I have never (sighs) been vain enough to make any presumptions that these or any other songs were about me. In fact, Jen, like for you to say that earlier on in this interview, um, kind of felt like news to me in a lot of ways. Cause I think, I don't think of th- this record being about that relationship. Um, and it's well, not, I mean, it's it not isn't, in it totality, isn't, right? right? Yeah. It's not in totality. No, there's a lot more to it than that. It is in some ways a document of that time. But again, it's like kind of going back to what we were saying before, where it's like records aren't literal. You know, they're they're not literal and autobiographical. They're like a documentation of a feeling. And so there are there are certainly things in the record that are inspired by and specifically relate back to our relationship and the demise of it. But there's a lot of other shit in there too that has nothing to do with you. I, yeah, I've just never been the kind of person to be like, this song is about this person or like this thing. It's like you're drawing from all these experiences in your life and you're sort of filtering them through the prism of like an idea, a central idea. <clears throat> and the idea is bigger than you and it's bigger than your life and it's bigger than one relationship. But that's what a song is. It's like, I wouldn't say that this song is is quite literally and specifically about just you. But I would also say that it's inevitable that every relationship that I've ever been in and lost has uh, contributed to the experience and the knowledge that was necessary to be able to create this thing. So in a way it is, you know.
Water's not assured You bow before my will But I believed it then Believe it still Oh, I believed it then Believed it still Looking back, you know, it's it obviously is really rewarding to have had such a great critical response to the record. But at the time, I was so caught up with my own guilt and shame and, and fear and self-loathing that I it just didn't really connect with me. And it's sad. I'm sad for myself now that I wasn't able to really be present for that and appreciate it as much as I would have liked to, you know? Because you only really get that kind of like breakthrough moment once. We've been lucky enough to have a long career and to continue to be able to have the privilege of making music and sharing it with people. And I hope to for a very long time, but you know, that, that first breakthrough moment only happens once. And, and I wasn't there. I was, I was somewhere else. And so, you know, like I mentioned before, it's, it, it is helpful to, to sort of learn in that moment that that's not it, you know, like that's not enough. That external validation is never going to be a replacement for the validation that you get from yourself, really believing in yourself and what you're doing and the work that you're doing. Now, I wish that I could have felt that way at the time. And in many, by many accounts, I should have been in that headspace, but it was almost as though I needed to have that experience to find my way back to myself. As much as it is sort of in the abstract, nice to be like, oh yeah, you know, people really like the record. It didn't really connect with me very much at the time because I just wasn't really like home to receive it. My experience was pretty different than Jen's through that, but I don't think that means that I was fully cognizant of like the impact that the record was having. You know, I feel like it took years to, I mean, it still happens where it's like, you know, there's people I know who I'm, I'm dear friends with who I met years later who are like, oh yeah, that record meant this to me or, you know, whatever it is. And like, I don't think I fully, um, at the time I had any conception of the reach that it was having we were touring some and doing our thing but we were we were so young you know we were living in baltimore so our community was very insular like a a very tight little community in, in baltimore the music community there and for me it didn't have to do to do with any personal strife or pain it had more to do with just being a kid you know just being like immature and not fully aware of of the world and maybe like a little bit like naive in the way of being like well this is just what it's going to be like all the time now (laughs) that too yeah i mean it, it you know records that we've done since then we realize how extraordinary it is to have a moment like that record has because you realize that everyone and everyone who works for everyone is constantly you know clawing their way to try to get that moment of what we had and that what we both sort of you know in our own ways kind of took for granted but i'm also glad we took it for granted because i think we needed to throw it away like i think like when you start chasing that that's how people lose it you know you lose your way you start making things that are the things you think people want to hear from you rather than trying to stay in touch with what you actually want to make. And people can tell. I, I mean, I think it shines through when someone's making something that's genuine versus when someone's just trying to like be the thing that they think everyone wants them to be so they can have their little moment in the sun again. You know, I think that it's good that we took it yeah. for granted because I think we had to throw it away. I love this record, Civilian. And I, I don't think I ever stopped loving it, um, even when it was, you know, there was a, a problematic relationship to it as a band, or even as we made choices to move away from it. I still relate to it. I still stand by the musical choices in it and just enjoy it. And um, I'm also really grateful that we took the risk of, for lack of a better word, of abandoning it after we made it and growing into something else. Because I think it was like the high point of like a certain version of ourselves 
I'm really grateful that we continued to grow and that we we pushed ourselves off balance to allow ourselves to to try new things like we continue to do now. After this record, when we were um, starting to really change our sound, one thing that I don't I, I don't know how much we ever talked about this, but like one thing that we really felt at the time was like it was either that we made a big change or that we would not be a band anymore. It was either it was either something really different or the end of the thing, and um, that was really scary and and painful at the time but it also led you know it led us on a path to something that's much more rewarding in the end paradoxically i feel grateful for this being the end of that thing but i also still love the thing i think i related to this record for many 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 years as an albatross as a thing that was a burden as a thing that I was sort of stuck with as this reminder of a time that I wanted to move through and a person that I no longer was, but was expected to continue to be. But I think looking back on it now, I can see it for what it is. And I'm proud of it. You know, I, I, it's really nice to be able to experience this thing with a little bit of separation from the baggage that it held for me for so long. I love the career that I've built for myself. I love the relationship that Andy and I have with each other and the things that we make. I'm proud that we've managed to let it evolve naturally and protect it in the ways that we needed to. And I can hear the record again as just a document of a moment in time. And I think it's a damn good one. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Why Oak. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase Civilian, including the 10th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. Thanks for listening.